Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of TC Talk, back today with another video, and in today's video, we possibly have the most impactful news since I started playing the game, in my opinion, potentially. One of, one of the most impactful news is since I've been playing the game way back in Monarch, one of the biggest ban-restricted announcements that we've had. We're going to go over it. This is like a pseudo live reaction, pseudo like just covering it. I did read it briefly. I obviously read what was banned and restricted and then kind of breezed over some of the other stuff. So we'll get right into it. If you're new to the channel, welcome. Thank you so much for stopping by. Hopefully enjoy your stay. If you're a long staying sport, thank you so much as always. We'll get right into it. So this came out at 5 Eastern, like as I'm driving home and I like rushed home to get here and then got on, saw what the news was and immediately was like, okay, we got to make a video for this. So this uh, originally was titled Rewriting the Book uh yesterday and it was blacked out where we couldn't uh or grayed out where we couldn't like click on it and er people were like is it a lore book announcement is it something big are they rewriting actual lore or is it just like a different direction of the game and it's definitely a ban restricted announcement with a little bit of design direction change or not change but reevaluation from james white so this is written by james white i'll, I'll breeze over some of it and then talk about the ban restricted because that's what really matters um James White says this October, Flesh and Blood celebrates its fifth anniversary. We've released 14 sets, 3,000 unique cards. Um, it's been an incredible journey. And this article was originally intended to be published as part of our fifth anniversary content running during October. The previously announced October 1st ban and restrict announcement. After further reflection, we think it's best to enter, it, it is in the best interest of fans to publish this prior to the Rosetta World premiere so the new format can be evaluated with clarity from the get-go and fans can make informed decisions when acquiring cards for the Rosetta season. Um, prior to Flesh and Blood release on October 11th, they spent years kind of developing the core pillars of Flesh and Blood, what they want it to be, and I'll kind of skip down to here. So according to James White, their four biggest design principles from the get-go with this game is start full, the start full game system simulates heroes coming to the fight at full strength and then wearing down over time, which I'm sure anybody who's played this game for a decent amount of time knows. The second one was reducing variance. Fab introduces a completely new resource system to the TCG industry. 100% of Fab games are interactive. Every turn, every game plays can be made to progress the game state. As we know, a lot of, one of the things that brings Fab, you know, to the to the fold is. Uh, you know, you don't get mana screwed is the best way to put it. Uh, every card counts during the course of most games. You will see every card in your deck at least once, so make sure they all count. And then finally, they reward good decisions, not luck. And th this is really good. And he goes through, like, all the, you know, the reasons. The key thing I want to point out here, and this is, this is going to give you a little bit of insight when it comes to us going over the ban restricted uh, cards, is this sentence right here. Uh, it's really this down here, but I'll read the whole paragraph. It's always been our intention to offer players ways to create offensive overlaps so the majority of games end with a hero being reduced to zero life rather than zero cards in the deck. As of late, offensive overlaps have become too extreme and too frequent to the point where principles achieving victory through the accumulation of many good decisions has been eroded, which is zen, right? Uh, the most egregious culprits are cards that immediately net additional cards without costing an action point or are playable by heroes that easily that are, are easily able to generate or bypass action points. So cards like Art of War, cards like Tome of Divinity, you know, these cards that are instant speed, draw a card, they don't take up your action point, and you're able to get incremental value basically with, with no downside for the most part, other than a little bit of variance into what you draw into, right? Then it says here, there are many ways you can view and quantify agency. Arguments can be made that effects such as Red and the Ledger, Warmonger's Diplomacy, Siren's Call, Arclight Sentinel, War Board States, and even Dominate are examples of diminished agency, which is true. However, there are massive differences between effects that diminish or restrict agency and the topic at hand, which are extremely offensive overlaps that result in a player being reduced to zero life, like out of their control. Um, there is no greater loss of agency than the game ending from forces that a player had no reasonable way to interact with. I would... I would uh, argue that Arclight Sentinel is almost uninteractable, but that's that's near here nor there. So because of all this, where to from here? Firstly, it's time to update design principles that will carry us forward to the next five years and beyond. While the initial principles were constructed to be our tent poles in the game design, it is critical now that we brought in these principles to cover the game's development well, guiding the two connected but independent functions. So the flesh and blood design principles of 2025 are... Action points, resource points, intellect, life, power, defense, and abilities. So 
It goes over here. Uh, the key thing that I wanted to go over is the Empower Agency. They want to curate a carpool and metagames where players have choices to allow them to meaningfully engage with the game plan of their opponents. Victory is earned through the accumulation of many good decisions. I really like this approach. The one thing, and it's not me being negative, it's just me saying I hope it doesn't get to this, is I love that Flesh and Blood is so much about, like, you know, if you make so many meaningful decisions, good decisions over the course of the game, you can increase greatly your chance to win. What I don't want it to become is chess, right? I don't want it to be this, like, almost, you know, yes, it's all about the decisions you make, but it's also, like, kind of just all statistical and, and kind of, you know, set forth based off what's happening right i want a little bit of fun in there right so hopefully they can manage that as time goes on they talk about different paths to victory and then we get to the part where everyone cares about it took only about 60 minutes to get here um secondly it's time to remove some cards from the official tournament play that are root cause enablers to extreme offensive overlaps remember in the bolded sentence it said cards that immediately net additional cards without costing an action point that's what you have to remember when you look at these cards so in um the following cards are banned in class constructed and blitz effective september 9th which will be next monday art of war bonds of ancestry cash in orion of the mystic tenets tome of etherwind which is crazy uh tome of divinity tome of the end all and tome of firebrand so let's talk about these one-on-one -on -one. The biggest one is Art of War. We'll, we'll go ahead and read what, what James says about Art of War, and then I'll kind of just give my own opinion on the other stuff. Because Art of War is the biggest one. A lot of people thought that the Art of War ban might be useful, but and some people were okay with it. Some people were really upset if it gets banned uh, because they didn't want like a powerful OG card to be banned. It's a pretty expensive card at one point, so I can understand people's hesitation. But it says, Art of War has been one of the pillars of competitive play since Arcane Rising. This is the most consequential of the cards being removed. I agree. Some people might ask why Blood Rush Bellow is okay where Art of War isn't. On the surface, they are both cards that cost one resource and trade two cards for two cards with a power buff as a typical payoff. Art of War being generic has meant has been enjoyed the privilege of interacting with every additional card that has been printed since its original release. As the card pool expanded, numerous ways to cheat Art of War's costed, costs have emerged, such as uh, Strider Reprisal and Zen, um, such as Shadow Cards and Fodder. It, uh, example example so our war being a generic kind of makes it a little bit more egregious right so for me if i can give my opinion for two seconds i agree with this ban um art of war is the most egregious but there's cards like art of war um in my opinion tunic which no one's gonna want ever here they'll never ban tunic this is my opinion art of war tunic even more common cards like sink below fate for scene snatch these are cards that not only are they very overrate powerful cards, you know, in various degrees, but they fundamentally, because they are all generic, will forever limit design space, right? The Like, if you take a simple card like Sink Below, the amount of tuning that they're going to have to give a certain class to want to play a defense reaction over Sink Below has got to be insane. Like, you think about the decompose mechanic in Rosetta, and the zero for three defense reaction at red that decomposes two. And if you decompose two in an action card, it goes up to four. Like, think of how good that card is. And it still is just barely on par with Sync Below, like as a defense reaction, right? So, all that to say, like, Art of War specifically, I get the ban. I'm not upset by it. I own Art of Wars, I've used them. Um, you know, that's it's here or there. There's going to be some people that are upset by it, some people that are okay with it. It is what it is. Um, I think it's healthy for the game moving forward, though, if I have to give super objective opinion. Bonds of Ancestry. Rip to my boy Katsu. Uh, Katsu really needed this card to stay to stay relevant, in my opinion. Um, like, Katsu is already going to be really hard to play, even with three Bonds. But without Bonds, the decks are just too efficient. And, like, I'm still going to play him. Um, and I'm really going to go back to, like, the mid-range version of Katsu now. But I hope they do something for the ninja combo class soon uh, that, you know, helps Katsu out. Because now there's no point in running Descendant Gust Wave. Uh, there's no, like, it kills the Dishonor line. And, like, that's, that's, that's the crappiest part. And it literally just dawned in my head as I'm doing this video. Banning Bonds, actually, yeah. You're about to see my live change of reaction here. Banning Bonds and Ancestry sucks <laughs> for Katsu specifically. So there's, two, there's a bad and a good side to this. The bad side is it ba it 
it just kills the Dishonor line, which was such a cool line in Katsu. Um, so, because like, there's no point in playing Dishonor now because you can't proc it. And now there's no point in playing Descendant Gust Wave. I mean, unless you want to play the Reds just to try to have a zero for five off surging, you could do that. Maybe you run like two Descendants just to try to get some value. But really, there's no point. So, for from a Katsu perspective, it blows. Like Katsu's, it sucks. But from a Ninja perspective, if I'm being super objective and I come out you know of of my bias lens i'm glad this card is gone in ninja because this card was going to forever gatekeep combo ninja as a mechanic because this card's just going to be more egregious the better combo cards you print the more bonds of ancestry uh is able to help and it's i mean this card's when it's comboed it's literally says zero for eight you know like imagine if rising knee thrust instead of a zero for five go again off leg tap was a zero for eight go again off leg tap and you get to pick like it's even better than that you know what i mean so you're not even a good example i can give so i'm glad that bonds of ancestry is gone you know objectively as a ninja player because it allows them to now do actually do something with the with the combo class i just hope they go back to on hit matters combo but that's a different video for a different time cash in i get why they banned it because it does fall in line with what they set up here right where they said cards that immediately net additional cards without costing an action point cash in immediately nets additional cards without costing an action point if you have that gold which because of the crown it's really easy to do that um orion of the mystic tenets also it's this is the most conditional card on this list but it does make sense per their design space that they're trying to go i'll tell you right now i am so sorry kano players well, I'm sorry for stacking Kano players. Like, if you want to stack as Kano, good luck now, boy, because you do not have Tome of Etherwind or Tome of Fiendal. Literally, a local Kano player to us last night drew like 25 cards on me off a stack plan when I was on Victor. And the reason he did was because of these cards. He stacked Tome of Fiendals with like blue, blue, Tome, blue, blue, Tome. You can't do that anymore. It is going to severely hurt Kano's ability to stack. And Kano is now going to have to play more of a straight-up game plan. But for Tome Aetherwind specifically, it does help. Similar to Bonds of Ancestry, this card was forever going to make Wizard have a little bit of issues in terms of design space. So I get it. Tome of Fiendal sucks for a lot of decks. But similar to Art War, because Tome of Fiendal is generic, it does create some issues. Because now every deck has access to the Straw 2 mechanic. And with Mage Master Boots, it's not that hard, you know, to, to do that. Um... Tome of Divinity is really interesting. Prism catching some strays. Uh, it's going to be a lot harder to loop now. It's still not impossible, but Tome of Divinity really helped Prism. Uh, you know, it it's a card that actually is somewhat contested in like the full Her Herald aggro version. So if you're running like a more aggressive Prism list, this card's not as bad. But uh, if you're running like a slower aura Prism, this card, it really hurts not having this card. Um, but it does, it does affect design space for illusionist light illusionist in the future so i get it and toma firebrand this card was innocuous i don't know if people remember this card um in uh phi but this is the if you have four draconic chain links uh when you play this it can draw two which in phi is not super hard it wasn't a commonly used card but again some of these cards like i think cash in Orion and Toma Firebrand were like the strays caught from just trying to stay consistent with where they want their design space to go. So I get it. It says the following cards are restricted in Living Legend. So you can have one Bonds of Ancestry in your deck. Wow. Uh, so that makes sense. So Zen's severely nerfed. And then they go through the reasoning for all these. Um, Bonds of Ancestry, I want to read really fast. We banned yellow and blue Bonds in the BNR just prior to Pro Tour Amsterdam. We expected this to bring Zen down a notch. Nope. Uh, we had Pro Tours in. Now it's time to bring Zen's Power Apex back to the rest of the field. As seen in numerous live stream games in PD Amsterdam and subsequent callings, Zen is re regularly, yeah, regularly able to present offensive overlaps beyond agency thresholds. Yep. We, we acknowledge this is a tough pill to swallow for Katsu fans, but frankly, what Katsu did with Bonds of Ancestry was also beyond reasonable. I agree. Um, saying that we will give Katsu fans new support in the future expansion slots to fill the hole that bonds left behind um so yeah i'm glad about that and it makes sense for all these other you can read these later on your own time i won't do this it says notably absent so cards that are not in you know that that fit in the design space they're wanting to inhibit but aren't in here is three of a kind tome of harvest tome of the arc knight 
and Tome of the Imperial Flame. Tome of the Imperial Flame is a big one. Three of a kind and Tome of Harvest both have natural limiters built into them that prevent multiple copies of themselves being played. That makes sense. Tome of the Ark Knight has enough positive variants. I agree. Tome of the Imperial Flame imposes a high deck construction burden. Comes with defensive vulnerability and most importantly, it does not net cards outside of a few Phoenix Flame interactions that currently exist. I agree. Those are all fine. And then wrapping up, these are some big changes. As I've written about in the past, our philosophy towards using ban and restricted lists is not only about addressing card interactions that create negative play experiences, but also a tool we actively manage our constructed format. So, it, last thing, we acknowledge that following the changes today, there will be some matchups in classic constructed that have polarizing play experiences. For some of those classes, such as Guardian and Warrior, there are cards and upcoming products that we believe will help them wrestle back to some of those points in those matchups. That's good. So, Overall, um, you definitely can read the rest. The next BNR is November 11th. Uh, I'm okay with all of these. Like, I get why they're doing all of these right here because they're following this new design philosophy. If they're following these, this new design philosophy actually, like, hard, then all of these make sense. Um, as far as the big ticket ones, like Bonds of Ancestry and Art of War, I know some people are going to be upset about Art of War. If you ask me my subjective opinion, I'm glad Art of War is gone. Uh, the card I think needed to go as long as they manage how well people can block. Because there was a time where Art of War was needed. Like in the old time era, sometimes you needed this card to really like get over the top. So as long as they manage that and they give people other agent, other ways to get around that fatigue agency, then I'm okay with it. Uh, Bonds of Ancestry, again, I'm glad this card's gone. It needed to be gone in Ninja. Uh, so now we can get back to playing Ninja how it was originally intended, in my opinion. No more Fi and Zen, like, you know, solitaire vomit your deck and hope you, and just win. I hated that. Um, hopefully we can get back to Katsu-style gameplay. But, yeah, let me know what your thoughts are. Uh, this was just a live reaction, not too long. Hopefully this made sense. Um, definitely check out the article. I'll put it in the description down below. Good or bad, right or wrong, let me know what your thoughts are. I'd love to hear it. Um, but, yeah, thank you all so much. You all have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you all next time on TC Talk.